So I welcome everyone. Um, this is uh, 2023 Data Science and Statistics Lecture. This has been an annual celebration since 2018. I'd particularly like to welcome our Dean of EIS, Gersela Lisi, Maureen Edwards, our Head of School in SMAS. This is a SMAS, uh, SMAS, by the way, is School of Mathematics and Applied Statistics. This is a SMAS special lecture. And Marika Banaham, who's director of NIASRA, and also Belinda Melmuth, Maria Belinda, I saw you come in, there you go, from Advancement, who's been by our side throughout the history of this. Our lecturer this year is Professor Antonietta Mira. She's a world leading innovator in data science and statistics, not only in research, but also in bringing its magic to primary and high school students. As part of her STEM activities, she has cre created an exhibit called Numbed by Numbers, and she won last year's G. Dosi National Prize for popularizing science for STEM students with publication of her, of her book, The Data Pandemic, Here is the Vaccine. Great title. Antonietta is Professor of Statistics and Director of the Data Science Lab at the Università della Svizzera Italiana in Lugano, Switzerland. She's also a professor in Subria University in Como, Italy. She's a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, the International Society for Bayesian Analysis, and the Istituto Lombardi Academy of Sciences and Letters. She does it all with publication of research articles in top journals, keynote presentations at international conferences, editorial board membership, and principal investigator on prestigious and competitive grants. Too many to list, I've just given the category. It is wonderful that you've made this long trip, uh, Antonietta. You're not new to Australia, I know, so before you agreed, you knew how long the trip was. And uh, we've been having a, a really good week so far, and it extends into the weekend to welcome Antonietta to the University of Wollongong. The title of a data science and statistics lecture is Data Science for Public Health, Risk Mapping of Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest and the Optimal Deployment of Defibrillators. Antonietta, thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for joining today's talk. So let me uh, start with a question. Uh, what do you see in this picture? Well, to me, uh, this is a research lab. Indeed, I see data everywhere um, and uh, Data science is what I try to do, try to make some sense out of this data. And specifically, uh, because we are in this smart building, uh, smart city is one of the topics of today because uh, using data for public health make a city smart or smarter. And um, there are many uh, indexes for smart cities. Uh, I took uh, this one, which is a um, well-established one by the Institute of Management Development and the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Uh, not only because it has Switzerland everywhere. Uh, Zurich is at the top uh, since the very beginning, uh, 19, 2019. Uh, but uh, Australia is also uh, in this uh, list. Uh, with Sydney uh, steadily around the uh, 20th position, ranking 18 uh, in the latest uh, uh, rank. So how do we make a city a smart city? Um, one of the way is through uh, infrastructure and uh, helping uh, public health through data. And this is what I'm trying to do with uh, the research I will tell you about today. So Ticino is the area in Switzerland where 
Lugano is located and where my main affiliation is. And this is an interdisciplinary project promoted by Università della Svizzera Italiana, my affiliation. And uh, it has been made possible thanks to the digitalization of uh, medical and social processes in emergency medicine in particular. And digitalization, which in my vision is a synonymous of more efficient medicine. And the objective of this project is twofold. First, we are um, developing a methodology for optimizing the network of public access defibrillators that are located throughout the territory in order to increase the efficiency of the emergency management in the field of cardiac arrest. We also want to estimate, build a map of cardiac risk in the canton in order to create a permanent observatory to manage the emergency in a smarter way and to develop a special temporal forecast model uh, of uh, risk for acute cardiac disease. We also have in place a traffic light statistical model uh, that I will talk about uh, towards the end. And uh, being a data scientist these days, we combine statistical model with machine learning algorithm. And again, towards the end, I will tell you about the recent efforts and by combining these tools. So our pilot project um, is indeed pilot and we are trying to export the model that we have developed to other cantons and outside uh, Switzerland. And we have already partnership with uh, Northern Italy uh, Emergency Service. And as I said, this project fits into the smart city team um, and more broadly in this uh, data-driven society um, effort that we are making. So some emblematic data to convey the importance of this research. Perhaps not everybody knows that among the causes of death, almost 50% are due to cardiovascular emergencies, including cardiac arrest, uh, myocardial infarction, uh, cerebral embolic uh, events, and so on. This is a very high percentage, considering that all forms of cancers put together account for about 30% of causes of death. These are figures related to US and Europe, but with reference to Australia, the picture is quite similar, with sudden cardiac arrest killing over 25,000 Australians per year. Uh, and this makes incredibly uh, one every 20 minutes. So this is a burning topic. Um, and cardiac arrest is a time-dependent disease in the sense uh, that every minute counts. Again, a single emblematic figure, um, one minute less access to a defibrillator corresponds to 10% more lives saved. So, and this is what we are trying to reduce, the time to access a defibrillator. Here are the research questions that I will try to address. First of all, uh, we would like to provide good data visualization by creating these interactive maps that are embedded in the decision support system of the emergency uh, units in Ticino. We want to uh, understand what is the average distance of a cardiac event to the closest public access defibrillator, PAD. We want to understand how many events are in the range of 200 meters from each defibrillator, because 200 meters uh, is the distance that we can cover by running and bringing back a defibrillator in due time to save lives. So in order to do that, we are trying to uh, find smart ways to position uh, new defibrillators or relocating existing ones. And as I said, to create a map of the risk of cardiac arrest and with this uh, traffic light model, uh, making highlighting cantons that are more at risk than others. And this helps the optimal placement, not only of defibrillators, but also of ambulances. So um, as I said, uh, we are aiming to build a decision support system that 
is currently being integrated inside uh, the ambulance service dashboard for the old Ticino area. Uh, data uh, of new events are updated daily and forecasts are routinely updated every month and but can be updated upon request. Uh, the system takes few minutes to run new predictions uh, if needed. And decisions are made based, uh, ma uh, based on uh, those predictions and those maps that we build. So data science, so let's start talking about the data. The data is both private and uh, open source data. We are lucky in Ticino because we have the registry of our hospital cardiac arrest, OHCH, uh, strokes and acute coronary syndrome, ACS. So those are acronyms that you will find throughout the uh, talk. We also have the registry of ambulances and the location of all defibrillators, both public and private, both fixed and mobile defibrillators. We have the registry of all federal buildings, because if I tell my statistical algorithm to optimize the position of the defibrillator, the algorithm might place uh, a defibrillator in the middle of the lake. We have a beautiful lake uh, in uh, Lugan, and we don't want that. So we tell the algorithm to place the defibrillators in uh, where buildings are present. We also use popular uh, population registry by age, group, and gender, and social demographic uh, uh, indicators, uh, including education, income, um, birth and death, uh, public debts, and so on. Furthermore, uh, we use data from the Meteo Suisse, for example, pressure, humidity, wind, temperature, solar radiation, and similar. There are literature um, showing that there is a direct link uh, with some of uh, the meteorological condition um, and higher risk of uh, cardiac event. They still don't understand exactly why some of uh, um, these uh, conditions are linked to uh, higher risk, but they're working on that. Specifically, there is a wind, this hot wind, uh, that increases uh, the risk of cardiac arrest, and they think it's related to um, electricity changes um, around our body. Um, we also have uh, air and light pollution factors and uh, uh, the medical e electronic records. And we are still not using this last piece of information, but we have a follow-up uh, of all um, people that underwent uh, cardiac arrest. So let me focus on the registry of cardiac arrest, which is the first reason why we started this research. Uh, so we have since 2002, uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest uh, events. Um, and on top of cardiac arrest, we have uh, um, ACS uh, since 2014 and stroke since 2015. This is in the Ticino area, but we also have uh, most of this data overall Switzerland. Uh, and for each event, we have the geolocation, the timestamp, information about the patient. We know whether uh, the patient underwent uh, CPR, uh, cardiopulmonary uh, respiratory maneuver, whether a public access defibrillator or an automatic external defibrillator was used. And we have the follow-up of the person. Um, these are uh, uh, the data that we have for Ticino, but uh, I found out that uh, for Australia and New Zealand, uh, this is information that I got from recent uh, papers, uh, Resuscitation and the British Medical Journal, quite updated. Um, so while individual register for out of hospital cardiac arrest in Australia and New Zealand um, were present in 2014, only recently these registries have been combined in the Australian Resuscitation Outcome Consortium, consortium uh, of Out of Hospital Cardiac Arrest, EPIS3. EPIS3 stands for Epidemiological Registry. And since 2019, uh, this registry covers 100% of Australia and New Zealand events uh, through eight uh, Australian and two New Zealand 
emergency uh, medical services. And this allowed to monitor temporal trends and determine risk adjust adjusted outcomes and enable a benchmarking across uh, different ambulance providers. And uh, this data is uh, crucial. And uh, if there's anybody who has been using this data uh, or knows uh, uh, something about this data and would like to try our modeling effort uh, for um, Australia or New Zealand, I'm happy to talk about this. So, again, with reference to Australia, in the non uh, emergency uh, medical service witness cases, 38% uh, of uh, the patient received bystander CPR, and only 2% received public access, uh, the defibrillator uh, maneuver. On the other end, for the, and so, and these figures are quite low compared to the ones in Ticino, and I clearly understand why, but we will get into this. Um, for the uh, EMS attempted resuscitation, 28% of the patient had returned to response uh, to spontaneous uh, circulation at hospital arrival, and 13% survived to hospital discharge or within 30 days from the event. And the survival of the bystander witness and shockable rhythm, this is a, a standard definition of the category of people that underwent uh, a cardiac arrest uh, um, event uh, that has the highest chances of surviving. The survival rate uh, in uh, Australia ranges between 27.4% to 42%. And this wide range um, is related to the fact that in Australia, as we all know, there are big cities, but large rural areas where, of course, the access to a defibrillator is much harder. Um, there has been a recent uh, survey, uh, you might or might not know, that uh, uh, in Australia you're going through a change of the sign from um, the standard green and white to the yellow and red um, signal, as you see there. And most of the people are um, positive about this change, 80%. But what's interesting is out of this survey, 32 of the um, person said that they were uncomfortable with using a defibrillator. And only 19% indicated a low likelihood of using a uh, a public access defibrillator in an uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest event. Um, of course, data science uh, has a long process to go from raw data to um, actionable knowledge. And the first step is pre-processing of the data. So let me tell you a little bit about the pre-processing. These are pictures I've taken myself while cooking with my mom. Um, so. Um, pre-processing of the data. The special unit uh, for us, this is a map of Ticino, are municipalities. And over the years, the Ticino municipalities have been aggregated. And here you see some of the aggregation. And um, events are uh, counted at municipality level. And of course, you understand that uh, if aggregation happens, uh, we get uh, to I have a reference here and uh, remap everything to the boundaries of the municipalities. So specifically, we took 2021 as the reference municipality boundaries, and we had a master's student process the data and realign them uh, with reference to these boundaries. This is not the only issue. Before 1998, the location of an event was done manually. So the emergency, uh, we're getting a call and the person was saying, I'm staying uh, next to the station at the crossing between this and this other road, roads that might not exist anymore. So again, we had a master's student take those uh, records that went manually recorded and input the corresponding GPS coordinate. Moreover, some of the event uh, self presented to the hospital, especially if the event happened close to the hospital. And on the other end, we have records of events uh, where the ambulance uh, intervened, which are most of them, but not all of them. And some of the patients are non-residents. Um, Ticino is an area where we have a lot of people coming in and out, especially from Italy. 
uh, of a population of 350,000, approximately 80,000 residents in Italy come to Ticino and commute for uh, working reasons. We have better salaries in Ticino. And this also creates problems with, uh, with our data. Um, so, um, moreover, uh, we have different level of uh, some of the spatial measurements. For instance, we have lattices for pollutants uh, that do not uh, correspond with municipalities. So in that case, we computed average of points belonging to the municipalities. We have irregular grids for stations of some of the meteor factors. Again, we computed, in this case, a weighted average with weights given by the distance from the center of the municipality. So we had to do a lot of realignments of the data. So back to uh, cardiac arrest. So it is a sudden event, and it is very difficult to predict by definition as uh, all sudden events. Sub, uh, cardiac arrest can strike any one of us uh, at any time and at any place and moreover at any age without premonitory events. Uh, and this is the case regardless of whether you're athletic uh, or young, famous or an ordinary pair person. You're not uh, Swiss, but you might recognize that some of this person are uh, actually the, the mayor of uh, Lugano. After supporting this project a lot, underwent a cardiac arrest and unfortunately he died. He was joking, uh, jogging, um, and uh, it was not witnessed. Uh, he had a cardiac arrest, not witnessed, and nobody could uh, bring the closest defibrillator to him. So because of this, uh, it, there's a clear need for an appropriate technological instrumentation and an effort for effectively allocating defibrillators close to us. I saw this one down in the lobby. Um, in Ticino, we have an app. No matter where you are, if you turn on the app, it shows you what is the closest defibrillator and it takes you there um, through Google Maps. And one of the, um, and this map was developed within this project. So not only Ticino is a beautiful canton and place where to live, uh, come and visit, it's really nice, but it is also one of the best places where to have a cardiac arrest if you really have to have one. This graph shows the survival rate of individuals who have suffered of an out of hospital. Uh, so not all cardiac arrests uh, are the same. Uh, there are some where using a defibrillator is useful. And those are called the uh, um, ventricular fibrillation or tachycardiac type of events. So focusing on those uh, type of events, this is the survival rate over time, starting from 2005 until last year. It goes up and down. Uh, the trend is positive during the pandemic. Of course, uh, everything went down, including um, the use of those defibrillators by first responders, and I will get to that. Um, so these survival rates are slightly lower than the ones uh, in Seattle, which holds the world record of survival rate from an out hospital cardiac arrest within the class of arrest where a defibrillator can be useful. With a 62% rate uh, in 2013, I have not been able to find more updated data, maybe because the rate went down and they only show uh, this highest, but uh, Seattle is uh, still one of the um, yeah, best countries, uh, cities where to have a cardiac arrest. So what about Australia? The Australian rate of survival um, of a cardiac arrest, as I said, ranges between 27 and 42 percent. So up is Seattle data, bottom is Australia. Um, and this is a result of the fact that there are few uh, the fibrillators around and um, CPR uh, is only undertaken 38% uh, of the time where there's a, somebody who witnesses an event. And uh, we can link this to the outcome of the survey I mentioned earlier. Um, 
not many people feel comfortable about doing that. And uh, within this project, uh, there are courses to help people feel more comfortable. So the number of defibrillators in Tisicidon has been steadily growing since 2005. And uh, the calls to the emergency system in red uh, also has gone up, except for the pandemic time. And in blue, you see the first responder interventions. So um, there's uh, uh, first responders uh, have been trained to, and, and they have an app. Uh, and as soon as a call happens, uh, by somebody who is witnessing a bystander, who is witnessing an event, uh, the call uh, goes to the emergency unit that sends an ambulance and at the same time um, sends a call to the um, bystanders uh, that are geolocated that find themselves close to the event. So the event is geolocated together with the first responders and up to seven first responders are called. Some of them uh, answer the alert. One of them typically goes where the patient is. The other one goes to the closest defibrillator and brings, brings it to the patient. So in the canton, uh, Ticino, there are around 350 cases of sudden cardiac diseases per year. 80% of these occur at home. And this is also interesting. In Australia and New Zealand, 76% of these uh, events occur at home. A survival rate uh, is uh, less than 10%. Um, and uh, in Ticino, 60% of the event are witnessed, while in Australia and New Zealand, only 37%. So this is probably one of the reasons why the survival rate in uh, Australia and New Zealand is, is so low. Um, and as I said, um, Cardiovascular diseases are time-dependent diseases, so for every minute that passes, the organ and systemic damage increases exponentially. And within four to six minutes, the brain is without blood supply and starts to be damaged. And that is certain about 10 minutes from the cardiac arrest. So... Um, evidence from a systematic review study uh, shows that the median survival time for patients surviving uh, after hospital discharge is uh, the median survival time is five years with a survival rates varying uh, three, five, 10, or 15 years uh, with um, a, a 10 year survival uh, rate between 62 and 65%. So this is overall. So in this map, um, you see a focus on the Ticino area. Here is uh, Lugano, and uh, the university is very close to the lake and the city center. In red, you see the events of out of hospital cardiac arrest. In blue, you see the defibrillators. So if each red dot, that is if for each case, we draw a circle with a radius of 200 meters, and we find the defibrillator the, that defibrillator is close enough to cover that event and to be useful. And uh, sorry, actually the radius has to be uh, 100 meters because you have to run, get it, and then run back. So the distance of 200 meters is conventionally indicated as the threshold beyond which a defibrillator can still save lives. But the quality of lives can be compromised, again, due to brain damage. And the greater the distance is, the higher this risk is. So we asked ourselves how many defibrillators are within a radius of either 10, uh, 100 or 200 meters and so on. So it turns out that in Ticino, 25% of the defibrillators uh, with public access, the blue, the red are the um, non-public access defibrillator, which might be, for example, in a pharmacy or in a university, which is closed at night, um, are within 100 meters. And um, so these are the first visualization that uh, are useful. Um, as I said, uh, most of the uh, events happen at home. Uh, and here is a similar plot um, where we distinguish 
where the cardiac event occurred at school, home, work. And for example, the coverage is much greater in the workplace than at home for obvious reason. Um, so again, if you want to have a heart attack, you better have it while working. Stress uh, can be a good cause. Uh, here is a distinction uh, related to the major cities in uh, Ticino. Uh, so Mendrisio is the, the, the best one, uh, again, to have a heart attack. So here's the map of the defibrillators in Ticino. And if we zoom in to Ascona, which is one of the beautiful city uh, on the lake, you clearly see that uh, by eye, those two defibrillators are better off repositioned. So uh, this we can do by looking at the map, but we want a way of doing this uh, automatically. So we have uh, uh, a model uh, that we call flexible location that not only tries to uh, find the best location of new defibrillators, but also what is the best way to relocate a given uh, a, a, a defibrillator. And the cost of a new defibrillator is much higher than the cost of relocating a defibrillator. So we compare our methodology with the existing methodologies. The most popular way is the population model. Uh, so in specifically the American Heart Association and the European Association Council recommend the placement of a public access defibrillator in areas in which a cardiac arrest has occurred in the past. So this is the population-based model. Um, and most models available in the literature uh, do not distinguish whether the defibrillator is in a rural or urban area while we do that. And um, so here are uh, two plots. Uh, for a given budget, um, our strategy is the population strategy in blue. In the top plots, uh, small is good because this is on the y-axis you have uh, the uh, percentage of uh, covered events. On the other end, uh, here you, uh, you have the distance uh, to the closest defibrillator. So you want uh, the defibrillator to be at small distance. In the first studies, um, we were drawing circles around an event of a radius of 100 or 200 meters. Then uh, we went to a more sophisticated way uh, to analyze the coverage uh, by means of realistic isochrones. Uh, so these are geometries representing the perimeter of areas that starting from a position, which is the position of the defibrillators, can be reached in three minutes by walking using uh, actual walkways. So we did this with your, uh, Google Maps. So the circular catchment are replaced with these 200 meter isochromes. And in this way, is it possible to estimate the number of arrests within each catchment, um, which was 32% with the given uh, positioning of the fibrillators, and the percentage of territory covered, 7%, and the level of overlap overlap between catchment areas, 31%, and the number of residents living in the area covered by the defibrillators was only 18%. If we put in place our strategy that suggests moving 200, uh, almost uh, 500 of the existing defibrillator at a cost uh, uh, of uh, about 350,000 uh, uh, Swiss francs, uh, the analysis reveals that the new positioning uh, with the same number of defibrillators would lead to a coverage of 53% of the arrest, so going from 32 to 53, an increase in 20% uh, points, which is uh, good. Um, we would cover more than 40% of the resident population with a reduction of the areas of overlap by 25%. So big improvement. Um, so let me now move to the statistical models. So this was done, everything I showed you so far, with uh, optimization technique. So the statistical model I will uh, briefly tell you about uh, are of two types. The first one is the integrated nested Laplace approximation. 
Um, so here we let YIT be the number of cardiac events of a certain type. I told you we are focusing on three types of events, cardiac arrest, stroke, um, and uh, ACS. At municipality I, we have uh, 119 municipalities uh, and over time. So this number of events has an expected value, uh, which is obtained as the product of the population at risk in that municipality in that time, which we call O, and mu, IT, which is the event incidence per unit of population uh, in the municipality and at that time. And this mu is obtained as the sum of six components. A common risk value mu, a fixed effect, which is linked to demographic, meteo, and pollution type of variables. So those are covariates that we use in our model X. Then we have a spatial component in green, a temporal component, a spatial temporal interaction component, and whatever is left over and a structured uh, random effect. So more precisely, uh, we model the counts with a Poisson distribution with mean given by O times mu. And mu, this rate, is a sum of, as I said, in blue, an overall risk um, common throughout uh, time and space, a fixed effect beta, which is related to um, um, the covariates X that we have. Then we have a spatial component, UI, a uh, spatial temporal uh, interaction, WIT, and uh, we have an structure random effect in purple, VI, and the temporal parameters, gamma. Then we have uh, some precision parameters, uh, which are the tau here and the epsilon. So taking a Bayesian approach to statistical inference, we put priors on all these parameters. Uh, some of them, most of them are non-informative priors, so centered around zero, meaning that, that uh, uh, for example, covariance has, has, a covariate has no uh, effect with uh, large variance. Uh, some of them have uh, a, a spatial component, uh, for example, UI, which is a spatial component, as a Gaussian distribution centered around the average um, value uh, of neighboring regions. Okay, so I don't want to go too much into the details. Uh, the, the temporal component has a, um, a, a spline structure uh, with uh, three um, um, splines, if you wish. But besides the details, uh, because fortunately there are areas in time with no events, uh, we have to take into account the fact that uh, um, we have to take this into account. So we have what is called a zero inflated Poisson model. So Poisson is the typical distribution for counting the number of events. Uh, but we have to take into account that at some time and for some municipality, the count is zero and uh, is more often zero than Poisson distribution would predict. And then uh, we put priors on this uh, parameter P and on the variance components, uh, the tau, the epsilon, and the, mm, and, and the phi. I will not get into the details. Um, what I want to show you is the risk map that we can build using these models. So uh, the maps I will show you uh, consider those covariates. So the population over time uh, in the municipality, the ratio of uh, male to female, um, uh, age groups, we have six uh, age categories, uh, meteor pollution, and the socioeconomical uh, type of feature. We have used the data until 2018. So here we are focusing of, on out of hospital cardiac arrest. So we have data from 2005 till 2018 to train the sample to estimate all the parameters in the model. Then we have a validation sample, and we do predict uh, for year 2021. And because we also have now data for 2021, we can tell how well we're doing. So how well are we doing? This is uh, R-squared. 
an index uh, which the closer it is to one, the better it is. And it is very high, um, not only in the training and test set, but also in the validation set. So we can explain almost 90% of the variability that we see in the data, and that is accounted by the spatial, the temporal, the spatial temporal interaction, and the covariates. And here's the type of map that we built. Um, so this is again the Ticino area, and uh, we have a map, uh, uh, an interactive system uh, over time. So here is where Lugano is. It's, uh, um, it has a uh, high population and high uh, risk as a consequence. These are um, number of events. Uh, so these are counts. We also have uh, a map corresponding to this with, uh, with uh, the risk. What is the error that we make? So in 71 of the municipality, the error, the prediction error is zero. So we get it exactly right. In 40 of the municipality, we get an error of one, either plus one or minus one. And in six of them, the error is of two. So we're doing very well in terms of prediction. And the emergency system was very happy about the results. Uh, and these are for the main uh, cities, uh, the actual uh, and uh, predicted and the observed numbers. So the predicted is in red, the observed is in blue. And again, for example, Gano is one of the municipalities when we get it exactly right. We also do long-term predictions uh, under different scenarios, depending on the um, hypothesis that we place under the growing of the population, both in terms of age and uh, gender. I will now show you these results. Because uh, I briefly want to move to a second type of model, which is the traffic light type of model. This is a, technically a hidden Markov model. So again, we model the counts of events over time and for municipality I, condition on a latent variable, which is a non-observed latent variable that, uh, in a sense, models the unobserved risk of that uh, location at, at that time. So um, the outcome uh, of this modeling effort is, as I said, the traffic light. So we have, again, all the municipalities, and we assign each municipality at each time to high, medium, or low risk. So this traffic light type of um, uh, model was um, very useful. Uh, they were very happy about uh, this outcome. And of course, being Bayesians, uh, not only we color in the region, but we can also tell how certain we are that a certain uh, municipality is at low risk. Okay, so we have uncertain quantification for all the predictions that we make. And again, uh, we're doing very well in terms of getting it exactly right uh, in 66 of the municipality, 43, a single error, um, and, and so on. Finally, uh, we also now have a, a PhD student who is very skilled with uh, machine learning algorithms. So I tell him, look, look, this is the data, what can you do? And they came up with uh, different models. They tried random forest and a bunch of other machine learning tools. You know, machine learning tools are sort of black boxes. You fill in the data and you get an outcome. Uh, out of these models uh, with um, a validation test, uh, he selected this uh, light uh, GBM. I will not get into the details of how this is done. He had an, a clever way of uh, selecting the features, but uh, instead of using all the um, covariates that I told you about, uh, age, uh, sex, uh, uh, socioeconomical variables, and so on, he only used the past history, so only the time series of the data, which is incredible because the uh, outcome of the predictions were very much in line with what we got with our statistical model. Uh, he only did something very clever by representing the municipality. So we can either do a dummy approach and have a dummy variable for each municipality, but uh, he built uh, what is known in machine learning community as entity embedding. Um, so he grouped the municipalities according to their 
previous records of events. Um, and in a sense, those uh, clusters of municipality were part of the modeling effort. So here are uh, the uh, various models I told you about in terms of the chi-square, which is a measure of how good the model is in predictive uh, the, the events. So this is the integrated nested Laplace approximation, which is the best. Here, the smaller, the better. This is a machine learning algorithm that only uses the past history of the data. And this is the traffic light type of model that only uses the demographic uh, feature in the data. So overall, the performance is similar. Uh, these are our other benchmark models available in the literature. Of course, the more covariates we use, the better we do. And the INLA model does best, but also because it uses uh, meteor data, economical data, and so on. And uh, the uh, machine learning tool, uh, despite not being very interpretable and despite not having good uncertainty quantification, did incredibly well. So let me conclude acknowledging the project participants beside uh, my university. This is a joint collaboration with the Cardio Centro of Lugano, which is the unique um, center where all patients are sent in case they need hospitalization. And when an ambulance goes to the event, uh, the um, electrocardiogram is sent directly in real time to the center and they decide whether the patient has to be carried to the hospital or not. And this is from the Ticino Quare, who handles all the ambulances and the defibrillators. And then we have data from uh, Meteo Swiss. So we have socioeconomical data. And of course, the Swiss National Supercomputing Center uh, provided the computational uh, tools that helped us. We have financial support from the Swiss National Science Foundation. I'm the principal in investigator over this project. And uh, besides Universidad de la Svizzera de Lanyana, we, uh, QUT also collaborated with this research with some PhDs and postdocs um, and other universities. So here is an alphabetical order, the collaborators that took part to the research. And uh, these are the papers that we published over time with this research. Thank you, Antonietta, for a great lecture. There is now time for questions from the audience. Because uh, the um, because we want to integrate this inside the uh, unit, the dashboard uh, that they see every day, they specifically asked us to give them a system that has the least number of variables outside the data that they already have. And because they have all the historical records, this is what they specifically asked for. And so this makes the system very portable. So if I come in Australia and uh, I want to do something similar here, I, I know that you have a similar registry. And so that is easy. I'll just give it to you. But you can say, okay, but I can access the meteorological data. I can access, and those meteorological data need to be updated, uh, uh, you know, daily uh, and similarly monthly, the uh, socioeconomical data and so on. Okay. so. This was specifically asked by them. Absolutely, yes. So the question is, uh, when we take into account the covariates, uh, sometimes they're not available. For example, uh, you know, what is the social demographic uh, uh, conditions uh, in this area, in Ticino, next year or in, 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 in two years? Yes, we do forecast them. We do take into account the uncertainty and we do uncertainty uh, propagation. Yes. Thanks. And so we do either do that or we do we, we reason in terms of scenarios. So what if the population uh, next year will be 5% older or in, in five years will be 5% older? Okay. So we, we, we do both. We reason in terms of scenarios and within scenarios we do, uh, do uncertainty uh, propagation.
So uh, that would entitle putting a subscript T in the beta component that handles, that is associated with the covariate. We don't think that's needed because we have a, a, both a special and a temporal component elsewhere that will take into account the variability over time and space and the potential interactions between the two. So no, but, but that would be an alternative way of handling that. The fact that the, the, the relationship itself changes over time.